Director, El Periódico, and Euroscientist, among other outlet, outlets. So we are here to discuss about the state of the art and the perspectives of convergence in the European science area, starting from an evidence that there is uh, a large amount of inequalities between European countries in research impact, in infrastructures, in funding, in the number of scientists per 100 citizens in almost whatever, whatever index you take, you will find a, a broad distribution between European countries. And this happens or appears to be widening as an effect of the crisis and the austerity policies implemented uh, thereafter. One of the largest or more important concerns are uh, whether these inequalities are producing unbalanced brain, brain fluxes or uh, brain drain, as it is often referred to. Um, but at the same time, research is possibly one of the areas in Europe in which Europe is felt as more united, especially in these times, in which in our areas we are not feeling that united, maybe. And certainly Horizon 2020, it contains a lot of measures that are aimed at uh, reducing this inequality without penalizing excellence and merit. Are these measures effective? Could more be done? We will discuss it. Uh, before presenting our speakers, I would like to, thanks, to thank the Marie Curie Alumni Association and especially Marco Mazia for organizing this webinar, and also Euroscientist and especially Sabine Wett, which is supporting it and also the technical support of Innova Plus. So let me introduce you the speakers. First of all, Amaya Moro. She's an assistant astronomy astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore in the US and an associate research scientist at the John Hopkins University. She works on the James Webb Space Telescopes of NASA uh, that will be launched in 2018. She's a physicist from Spain. Uh, with a PhD from the University of Arizona. She has worked in Germany, at Princeton, and at the Center of Astrobiology in Madrid. She's a, member, she's a member of the governing board of Euroscience and of the Royal Society for Physics. Uh, and uh, maybe mo even most impor more importantly, she's the founder and the spokesperson of uh, uh, a grassroots movement that started in Spain with the name of Investigación Digna and that has now uh, achieve the European level, if you Google, they have chosen ignorance, you will uh, find a very interesting open letter that any scientist can, uh, can sign. Uh, so maybe Amaya, you can say hello so people can uh, identify you. <laughs> okay, she's there. Then we have Kieron Flanagan. Uh, she's a lecturer in science and technology policies at the Manchester Business School and member of the Manchester Institute of Innovation Research She's a, he's a biologist uh, turned into a social scientist, and he's a specialist in studies of innovation and innovation policy on funding and management of research with a special interest in brain drain. Uh, he's also an active commentator on science and technology at the political science blog uh, at The Guardian. Our third speaker is Katrin Maas. Uh, she's the chief uh, policy officer of the League of European Research Universities. She's a linguist by education and she has worked in the US at the University of Delaware uh, as a linguist. And in 2004, she joined LERU, the League of European Research University, with this responsibility in uh, policy development. And she's definitely an expert in European Union research policies and programs. Our fourth speaker was meant to be Octavio Quintana, the director of the European Research Area, but apparently he had to fly to Brussels because the commissioner apparently is having some uh, uh, doubts with the budget, some issues with the budget, and so he, he told us he will not be able to join us. So we will have a discussion with this, this, between these uh, three high-profile speakers. Um, I would like to thank you for joining the discussion, you, the public. We are now at the moment uh, 53, but there are around 180, 180 registered people, so 180, and we expect to have more. Um, let me tell you a few practical issues. Um, there, we will have a, a moderated debate between the speakers for around 40, 50 minutes. 
then depending on how many questions from the public we collect, we will have around 10 to 20 minutes of uh, uh, um, questions and answers um, by the public. I will uh, do the questions for you for a practical reason. I will receive the written questions and, uh, and I will uh, pose it to the speakers. A practical way to do it is that you can use this chat box that you can see, I think, on the right of your screen. There is a tab in the application called chat. Uh, please do not use the questions tab. Use the chat tab and address your chat to the organizers and panelists. If you use the questions tab or you don't address the chat tab to organizers and panelists, we will not be able to see your questions, and that would be a pity. Okay, so I think that's all as an introduction, uh, and let us start with our debate. So I would like to start asking the three speakers about their vision for the future of uh, European science. So what they forecast and what they would like to see uh, in the future of European sciences and, and whether the, what they forecast is what they would like to see. So are we heading towards a situation in which excellence will be localized in a few structures, in a few countries, and the rest will be devoted to something else that is not science or to a lower level science? Or are we heading to a future in which a high quality science will be widespread throughout the continent. Anybody can start. Maybe Kieran? Sure. Um, okay, it's a big question. What I'd like to see, I'd like to see um, a, a European research area, let's call it that, that retains the diversity of, of the current European research area in the sense that, you know, different um, specialisms can be um, represented in different places that that retains the ability for for focus on things that are of particular interest in particular places you know um, uh, issues of, of, of culture of, of history of of, 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 of language etc that are more national or local so that plays to those local specialisms and strengths and things like that whilst um, supports um, what you called excellent science um, throughout Europe where there's um, a high degree of possibility for researchers to collaborate um, across Europe and, and with researchers outside of Europe um, where mobility is also what you, what you forecast no, this is this is not what I forecast. No. <laughs> um, what do I forecast? Okay, I, I forecast um, uh, more of the same. I, I forecast um, a kind of two-speed Europe of science um, uh, with national systems, because science is predominantly organised in a national way, even though it's a, a, a an internationalised activity. Um, that are very different in terms of their, their philosophy behind the, the funding and the structure, the, the um, bureaucracy that's associated with that, etc. So I, 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 I don't see those things changing very quickly. I see that we continue to have a t a a a attempts at the European level to kind of compensate for some of that and to promote collaboration and all that, and that's welcome, but that by itself is not going to be enough to, 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 to change some of the the problems that we see in some some European science systems, other European science systems um, uh, that are stronger because of the way their funding and the, the way their policies work. Of course, they have their own problems because there are problems that come with success as well as problems that come with um, uh, yeah. a less effective or efficient system. But uh, so I, my my prediction is things won't change very much. And Amaya, what do you think? I I agree totally with Kiron on what I would like to see, but I disagree on what my forecast is in the sense, and I think this is just a question of perspective of where we are. He's in uh, England, I'm in Spain. I see changes very rapidly, at least in the countries in the south, in the sense that things are deteriorating tremendously. 
as the austerity measures that are being imposed from Europe are uh, basically dismantling the, the R&D infrastructure that we have in our countries. And this is creating a situation where we are accelerating a change to, you know, just funding a, a few strong institutions uh, and the rest is just being left on its own. And, and the system is, uh, is deteriorating to the point like, that like one of our most important institutions is the European Research uh, Council. Uh, I mean, sorry, the, the Spanish National Research Council in Spain. And you know, in uh, the last few years, it's been at the verge of bankruptcy. So in our case, uh, the situation is deteriorating very, very rapidly. So my forecast is that uh, in countries like Spain, things are going to become worse if nothing is going to stop this. And of course, what I would like to see is exactly what Kieron described it to that you know to to keep that diversity because the diversity has been proven to be uh, critical for the advancements of, of science so not business as usual but business worse than usual let's say and green uh, mars can you bring some hope into this discussion maybe mm. well um a forecast i wish i had a glass ball and um, that would all put us in a competitively advantageous position, I think. But nobody has a glass ball, and if we uh, and 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 we don't have. I should say. I mean, I speak for a league of 21 universities that are um, very research-driven uh, at the top of their game and do everything they can to stay at the top of their game. When I hear them talk. Um, I hear about the lack of investment in science and in research in general. In some places it's better, in other places it's not as good. I mean, the universities that I represent come both from, let's say, the UK and from Spain, and um, it's not to, to, to show these two to 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 um, extremes. There, you know, there are ten countries in there. They all have degrees of science and investment in science, it goes up a bit, it goes down a bit, it goes up a bit, sometimes big, sometimes slow. There are really variations over time. I mean, I can see how France has changed over the last 10 years, how Germany has changed over the last 10 years, and I can't predict that. But I can say that all those universities will say, if we want to remain in the global game, uh, we need more investment and we need more trust from our governments in science and that means investment in science and that means you have to make choices and you have to support excellence otherwise we might as well forget it and we all go home and we leave science to the United States, to China and to other places where it will happen. If we don't invest in excellence it's, 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 it's just not going to happen, we are not going to remain competitive. Now, at the same time, they also say, um, you know, diversity is our strength in Europe. And that's, I believe that true. I've seen it in the 10 plus years that I've worked in Europe in science policy, that that is really true. It's not just something that people say. And we should find ways of, um, of, of, of harnessing that strength. Um, so it's a way of finding a way of finding win-wins, of finding both strengthening the competition and the ex excellence agenda and the, um, if you want it, justice, a better um, division of resources agenda and finding how you can address those. And we'll get to those, I think, later in our talk a little bit when we talk about yeah. Horizon 2020, for instance, and how they try to do that. And I, I mean, I understand your vision, but do you think we are moving uh, towards that goal or we are moving away from that goal, especially given that we have had a very strong uh, crisis in the last few years? Yeah, I'm not very, I'm, I'm not very optimistic, sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> I see your point. Okay, so now it would have been interesting to hear the point of view of somebody from the Commission, but unfortunately he is not here. So, um, because of a funding uh, crisis, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the details. Okay. Um, now, I mean, let us try to to I mean focus on facts now on the current situation. That is, uh, how 
is uh, inequality, let's say, declined in Europe? What are the may big areas in which we could divide the European Union? What are the big differences that one can highlight? Maybe, Katrin, if, since you have this uh, overview of so many different universities, you could start first portraying the, the, I mean, giving the picture of the current situation. Hmm. I had to think about this question for a while because, I mean, what do you mean about the quality of science? I can measure the quality of science in many different ways. I, I can look at just bibliometrics and um, research output, uh, in publications, citations. I can look at impact. I can look at the broader uh, dimension in which era is set, which is about um, also about gender, also about open access. I mean, how do you measure all those things? That's really um, an impossible question, if I can if I can say that. That said, you know, let's say some try and say something real also. Um, if you the the European Commission, for instance, looks at its innovation scoreboard and it looks at innovation leaders and innovation adopters, early adopters and the strugglers or the followers. You can definitely see more or less those three packs of you know, um, countries, member states in Europe. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way is looking at, uh, for instance, the European research area and the five dimensions that are being measured. When they did the survey, the progress report on ERA, you could look at the European Commission looks at it in terms of which member states are more era compliant and which aren't. So how are they doing on measures when we try to measure things like open access, like technology transfer and gender and so on. Gen by gender I mean usually a balanced gender and it often means women in science. So, so um, definitely there too we have these blocks. They don't always um, they're not the same. They vary a little bit uh, in, in terms of which countries belong in which blocks. Hmm, I see, I see. Amaya, do you have a vision, a geographical vision of how the situation is? I have, yeah, like in my mind there is an image that I cannot take uh, off my mind and it's that when you do the, when you look at the investment um, in R&D with respect to the GDP, um, all the countries that have been uh, rescued or uh, politically intervened by, by Europe are systematically below the average level of uh, G, uh, funding in R&D with respect to the GDP. And, you know, all the countries that are, that are doing very well are, you know, on the other side of the... So there is this dichotomy, there, there is this uh, that uh, is very striking. And uh, I think the austerity measures are making them is making this gap even worse uh, because basically it's cutting off possible ways of recoveries for these countries uh, in order to you know have economies that are uh, more robust and and less vulnerable to to all the economic crisis that we've been suffering so um i i see that there is a gap and as unless we do something about it um uh, that we will be discussing in the in the during this webinar, what can be done? What can be done? I don't think uh, there is uh, there is any hope that this gap will be you know getting smaller and smaller. So I think there is a clear you know discontinuity that is increasing at this. At so this you see it. I understand you refer especially to the north south division. That's yeah, right. yeah, it's basically the north south division, yeah. right? Like, yeah. you know, you look at the investment uh, with respect to the GDP of countries like, you know, all the countries that have been intervened or, or, or rescued Greece, Portugal, Italy, mm -hmm. Spain, mm -hmm. Ireland. Mm -hmm. I mean, they all systematically are below that uh, yeah. average level of investment of, on, of about 2%, right? That is in the European Union right now for RD. Yeah. So, but I, I would say, we are at, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say one could also see an east-west division That's or well. division yeah. in terms of the yeah, when the countries have joined the European Union in in time. Uh, what do you think, Kieran? Yeah, I think uh, um, I mean the R and D as a percentage of GDP is a very tricky 
measure because it's measuring much more than what we would normally think of as science. So in, mm. it's not just fundamental science paid for by the taxpayer, it's also um, very applied R&D. Um, and of course the majority of it in most countries is accounted for by company expenditure and R&D, which is nearly all D and development, uh, improved products and things like that. So. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a poor measure. Then, then there's the, the bibliometrics and things like that, Katrin mentions. Um, uh, so the, it's very, it, it, science um, can mean lots of different things. Um, and, it, and it's quite a slippery thing to, to unpack. Um, I agree with what Katrin said about um, you know, not being one kind of, of, of measure of, of strength. Um, there's excellent science all over Europe. Um, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, uh, but excellence is not unidimensional and excellence has lots of characteristics. Um, in the end, in, 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 in fundamental science in research, you know, excellence is defined by your peers and so things like bibliometric indicators based on citations which give you some indication of that, however imperfect, might be a way to, to, to look at this. But I, I want to suggest a different way of looking at it which is um, and to hmm. think about um, Dynamism, a dynamism of the of, of the science system in different different countries. Um, so think about systems where it's um, uh, it's more dynamic in terms of creating funding opportunities, in, in terms of creating job opportunities for scientists, um, which engenders their mobility and inward mobility, attracts people and creates opportunities for career progression and development. Um, and I think you do see some of our National science systems are more dynamic in that sense than than, than, than some others, which um, maybe spend a lot of money, but spend it in a in a quite a rigid way um, through uh, large national bureaucracies where everybody is a civil servant. I don't want to mention any names of any countries, but you know, um, uh, you know, they don't spend not the only one. So you know, and 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 I said right at the outset that. Dynamism brings its own dangers. It has its own costs as well, um, and uh, and and they shouldn't be um, discounted. So we need to think about that too. But I think that's an that's a useful comparison to make, and you can see that dynamism reflected in the the, the countries that scientists move to in Europe. Okay. So would you say? So, for example, giving this uh, spatial division north south, east east west, and the time division, I mean the time that the core countries that were at the beginning of the European Union and those joined that in successive waves, which one would you say is more influential in uh, defining the differences or inequalities? Is it more a geographical division? Is it more a time setting division? Any I, don't think it has, I don't think it has anything to do with when you joined the European Union. <laughs> oh, okay. I okay. think these are long rooted historical patterns of, uh, of ways of doing things. So, okay. What do you think, Catherine? I'm reminded of a um, yeah. I, I wanted to come back to the the north south versus east west um, divide also. Uh -huh. Just um, and if you look at the European Research Council, I, I think it's countries that don't even belong to the EU, like Switzerland and Israel, both of them, uh, getting more out of the European Research Council. Than all of the EU 15, which is a cover name for the new the newest member states in the EU together. That's an impressive. Yeah. Yeah. That's an impre that's a really impressive figure. Impressive in a in a you know in a negative sense. Yeah. Um, so what are we going to do with it? We really do have a problem. And and yet I I, I come back to my previous point that we we cannot abandon the excellence uh, agenda. Um, but I also I very much like uh, Kieran's uh, comment on dynamism in the system. I mean, one of the things that I always often say in Liru also, and it's it's about people. It in the end, it's about how do you make yourself attractive to to talent. Um, compare it to opera houses in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, wh where the stars would move to different opera houses, and whoever could offer the best, the most creative, attractive environment, that's where people will go. So, governments and 
in universities and others, everybody that has a say in this has to think about what this is worth to them, to be a place of dynamism, to attract people, and really okay. to invest in people. And okay. Spain is one I of the countries... I to ask you... No, I was just going to say that Spain is one of the countries that is tremendously suffering for this lack of mobility and lack of opportunities. The system is very stiff. Um, basically, there are no permanent science positions that are non-governmental, and this means that uh, in order to apply, you have to belong to the European Union. Um, you know, people from other countries outside the European Union won't be able to get a permanent position in Spain. And, and also, if you want to work at a Spanish university, you need to have an, a special accreditation that you can only get if you already work at a Spanish university. I'm, for example, you know, I can have uh, job interviews at, you know, high-ranking universities in the U.S., but I wouldn't be eligible to apply to a small university in Spain because I don't have this accreditation. And so there, there needs to be um, urgent measures to uh, need to be taken. Uh, in 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 this case, to you know, increase the dy the dynamism of of some of the research uh, R and D systems in some of these countries, because otherwise we are doomed. We are really doomed uh, without this lack of mobility, okay. and uh, we are doomed. Okay. So it's not only a question of lack of resources; it's also a question okay. of stiffness mm -hmm. of the system. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's intrinsically unfair to the people in the system, yeah. the people who are being trained and brought into that system, whether the opportunities are not there, or um, the process of getting opportunities is so kind of politically charged that that, that, that it's not a it's not a, a meritocratic process. Um, I mean, no system is perfect, but you know uh, there are these. And and of course, it's not fair to the taxpayers because they're wasting money essentially on uh, on the money they spend on science. So a lot of it is going to maintain these structures rather than to pay for for, for good science. By the way, now we have arrived to 60 participants to the webinar. Hello to the people that have arrived later. Um, I want, to, I plan to ask you about the reasons uh, of these inequalities, but you have already pointed out uh, many, many issues. So let's go straight to, let's say, approaches or solutions or measures that uh, could be taken for leveling the field. So maybe, uh, Catherine, uh, could you give us an idea of what is being done at the European level to level the field? Um, I understand that um, Horizon 2020 is uh, implementing a whole set of mechanisms for uh, uh, this issue. Uh, do you think, could, could you give us an idea and do you think also with, a, I mean, with an opinion whether they are being effective or they um, seem to be effective in the future or not? Okay, again, from my perspective, on the one hand, I think you should have had Octavi <laughs> look at this question, but if you're happy to, yeah. to have my perspective on this, I think we need to take both, in, both into account um, the, say, say, the framework program, Horizon 2020, and on the other hand, uh, structural funds. And you have to realize okay. that the structural funds, which are meant to uh, make money go back to those member states that are uh, less performing in, in, in lots of ways across the board. We, I'm not just talking about research now. Um, that Those funds are big. Um, the framework program is maybe 80 billion. The structural funds is maybe 300 billion. It's a lot of money. Uh, Horizon 2020, the framework program, is decided by the Commission. They design it, they administer it, they, man they manage it, they dole out the money. And so there, in there, there are now good initiatives, like the ERA chairs, where, for instance, um, and, and the Commission has defined what is sort of the underperforming and the well-performing uh, member states, and otherwise who is eligible to do what, so that an ERA chair would be a place where there's less performance, can able to attract professors to come over there to set up programs to really build capacity in a certain area. Uh, you have the twinning and the teaming, which is like setting up centers of excellence. Uh, we've been telling our universities, Lira universities, for years, even before this was in the Horizon 2020, guys, you need to get in on this act. Europe is not only about excellence, it's also about getting everybody on board because otherwise we're not going to win. They're finally starting to listen to us and um, you know, several of our universities 
have these um, uh, teaming projects, uh, mostly with uh, Central and Eastern European uh, universities. So that's that's encouraging. I think those instruments and so the, the way they is basically are coupling. Uh, that uh, just for those that don't know, is basically coupling research institutions in two different countries in order to promote some kind of interchange and some kind of. Uh, uh, the team is leveling the fields in upwards in terms of excellence. Sorry to interrupt you. Just to yeah, focus two or more to on a specific something. research field or a challenge, uh, a research challenge that the European Commission wants to um, have 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 uh, addressed. Um, and I lost my train of thought now. Do you think uh, it, it is effective, and I think that's that's working. I, I would and oh yeah, I wanted to say the good thing is that this is and should be um, also looked at in terms of what is called smart specialization. I think Kieran mm. talked about this as well. Um, everybody can't do everything. Um, that's true for any university as such. You can't do everything. You can't be uh, excellent in every field of science. It's the same for regions and for countries. You can't be excellent in everything. So you have to make choices. Um, I know of an example where people are from Leuven are twinning with Malta because in Malta they have expertise um, on, on a specific thing that is useful to Leuven. So they want to work together and that's where it works when both partners see the win-win to get to work together. So that works well and there could be and there should perhaps be more of that type of initiatives. It also helps when the Commission is helping to uh, bring expertise um, to the areas that need it. So they have uh, what are called national contact points, which are helpful information uh, centers to help uh, the local institutions, organizations to apply for EU funding, because we know it's difficult to apply for EU funding. If you don't have the experience and the expertise in it, the competition is so hard, success rates are so low that you don't have a chance um, again, Lira universities have gotten the hang of this over the years and they have lots of people who uh, prepare researchers to put in bids, to put in um, projects and so on. So when the European Commission makes available money so that national contact points can help share expertise about how you have to participate in European projects, that's a good thing. Okay, that's about Horizon 2020. Sorry, if I can finish it. Structural funds. Yeah. It's a lot yes. more money, uh, but it's the member states that decide how they are going to use that money. And so they also have to be use those smart specialization strategies to what they're going to use that money for. Right now, you know, the typical thing to say is it's being, a, it's being used for roads and bridges and hospitals, and that is needed too. But if you are serious about getting ahead, you need to invest in research and you also, you can use that money for research infrastructures, for training people, for capacity building in research. And that's where they should be serious as well, you know, if they, if they want to get ahead. And do you think... You just, um, if you use a small part of that money for research, it would make a big difference. A okay. big do you think countries have got this message and they are likely to the money like this or may they be too tempted to use it, let's say, the old way to make bridges and, and uh, streets and whatever? They're very tempted to do the latter, of course. Uh, I mean, it was, think of it as from a, you know, this may be cynical, but from a political point of view, this is how you're going to score uh, if you build roads and hospitals and that things. It's, it's, it's not very sexy. It's not very uh, politically rewarding to invest in research because you don't see the rewards right away. It's a long-term investment. Um, so there's, okay. a, there's a need there to, to bring that message as well. Okay, okay. Being, so, uh, the any is, other of the... Sorry if I can finish this. The EU is also um, uh, pushing uh, member states a little bit. Um, uh, this, um, the, the growth agenda, the research investment agenda is, is taken up in what is called the European semester. Member states yeah. have to make action plans about what they're going to do. If they don't follow them, if they, you know, the European Commission has a certain amount of 
leeway to call, to take what they are called what they call uh, corrective measures. So you can tell the member states you've been a bad boy, do better, try harder next time again. Of course, member states are okay. have. So have national competence. The, the Commission can't rule over them. You know, they, they, they can only uh, give them indications and try and push them in the right direction. Okay, so just before going to Kieran, which I think is really willing to say something on this, as far as I can imagine, uh, just to summarize, so there is a whole battery of measures, so ranging from those internal to Horizon 2020, like uh, era chairs, twinning, teaming, etc to the big issue of structural funds, and there is also this new system, the European semester, those that maybe don't know it, it's basically a way through which the Commission, I understand, can somehow influence policy of national states, of countries, and there is a special chapter on research. So countries must say what they want to do in research, and then there is some kind of, account of accountability on this. Even if it's not, I mean, obviously the, there is sovereignty in the middle, so the European Commission can kind of decide instead of the states. So, Kieran, what do you think? Is this battery of measures enough or even close to enough to level the playing field? Okay, uh, action, action at the European level by the Commission and by the European Union as an intergovernmental organization cannot level the playing field because um, although, uh, although Katrina is completely right, structural funds are very significant. Um, um, and the Horizon 2020 is a very large amount of money. Um, it's a small amount of the total money that's spent, public money uh, spent on science, research and development in Europe. So it's a, the European um, interventions are at a relatively small scale. The programs that we talked about there, the error programs, twinning and chairs and things like that, those things are very welcome. Um, and if they go with the flow of the way science actually works, then they, they, they will have positive benefits, but, but they're a kind of drop in the ocean, really. You know, it, 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 uh, uh, from the European Commission providing support for, for somebody to move to a, to a country uh, as a, a star professor and to establish a research group, that's, that's fine, but that professor will still encounter all the same problems in that country structural problems, the lack of dynamism, the, you know, the difficulty in attracting other people there, um, the difficulty in those people making careers there. Um, if those more fundamental issues are not addressed, and these kinds of programs by themselves don't address that. So what they do is they support a natural tendency in science. You know, so all scientists, all our scientists are international. They all, they, all they, they, they live and work in international networks, international communities. They know they know their colleagues all over the world, they interact with them, um, and so these, these programs can help support that, can provide funding for that, but only if the context is there to enable that as well, otherwise it's, it's problematic. The structural funds thing is great, it's very interesting, the way countries have moved, some countries more than others move to, to, towards using um, structural funds to build um, scientific infrastructure. Um, there are some, some seem to have been better at doing that than others, uh, just as some have been better at building roads and airports than others. You know, some countries have built airports that, that no flights have ever um, taken off from. Um, uh, so, uh, and it's the same with scientific infrastructure. If you, you know, money from Europe for scientific infrastructure could help a country upgrade its capabilities, or it could just create cathedrals in the desert. You know, big shiny uh, facilities where there is no um, dynamism or local funding to support them, um, and both of those yeah. things can happen. So, Amaya, what do you think? Is what Europe is doing enough, or could it ever be enough to level the playing field, or is it more something at the national state level? I, I totally agree with everything Kieran just said. I think uh, the what Europe can do is limited, uh, and it won't uh, level. Um, the situation uh, throughout Europe unless there is significant changes at the national level because about 90% of the investment in R&D is coming from, from the national uh, states, right? It's only 10%. Um, but having said that, uh, I think that uh, the European institutions have shown that they can exert a very strong influence on national policies. And I think this is where they have to leverage to, to, to change these atmospheres 
the, this atmosphere so that to change the, the systems to encourage these changes so that um, these uh, initiatives about teaming, for example, uh, actually are not a drop in the in the desert. That they they actually uh, can trigger some 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 more dynamism. And so uh, I I think, for example, that um, uh, you know, in the same way that uh, all these austerity measures that have been imposed uh, have led to you know, very significant changes, for example, in retirement age, or, or changes the constitution of some countries to put a, a debt to the to the, uh, I mean, it's still into the debt. Um, they could equally, you know, encourage investment in R and D because uh, it's proven that you know more investment in R and D can, uh, you know, increase the the GDP of the countries. Right? It's, it's, uh, we need we need some in some countries. I think we need some encouragement from the outside. From institutions in, in Europe, <laughs> uh, in order to actually change our, our economies to, to knowledge-based economies that are less vulnerable. So I think um, that yes, the the amount of money that is being poured and all these initiatives that uh, are coming from Europe are, are are welcome, obviously. But I think um, uh, even more efficient will be changes, encouragement to changes in policy. And in some yeah. countries, we badly need these changes because. In Spain, for example, it follows a cyclical policy of R&D investment in the sense that, you know, when the economy goes bad, they cut drastically, and they only invest in R&D when the economy goes well. And what we need is a change to an anti-cyclical policy, right? And mm -hmm. uh, so but there are some concrete measures that I think can be taken from Europe, for example, um, uh -huh. uh, in order to increase the dynamism of our universities, of our research centers. Um, you know, they, they could uh, encourage some changes in, in the, the, the way we do the hiring. Uh, right now, like if any researchers wants to work in Spain, they need to ratify all university degrees with a very expensive and very long process that Michele is very familiar with and I'm very familiar with because we, we both have degrees from, yeah. from other countries and had to go through the process. And I mean, this is something that doesn't exist in other countries, right? So, so this is something that you know the European institutions could could put a stop to it, right? And and it's not only that. I mean, you need to have um, they're just as I said, all the positions are government positions, and they have very strict regulations. And and I think there are other things um, that um, uh, that you know the European institutions could suggest. For example, um, in Spain, one of the problems that we have had is that many of the changes that have been in, I mean, there has been cuts in funding, tremendous very drastic cuts in funding, but also um, um, also there has been some policy changes that, uh, in, and, and the, the, you know, the, the feedback that the scientific community have sent to the government has been completely ignored because we don't have, we don't have uh, uh, any, any type of, um, uh, so in, in Germany, for example, you have a scientific council, right? And, and the, I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't dictate laws, right? But the government kind of, you know, listens to it. Yeah. In Spain, we don't yeah. have anything like that, I right? See. So maybe the European institutions could encourage the, you know, formation of these scientific councils in all countries and, you know, say that, you know, oh, you can okay. apply for European funding unless you have, you know, a scientific council that actually okay. sends feedback or... But so, you would like to see as much, let's say, European intervention that is seen in the debt issues, for example, in research. Yes, somehow. I mean it's ironic yeah. that I say that because I think there is way too much now in the in the sense of austerity, right? In that, but at the same time, I think it's you know positive European intervention will be extremely welcome, uh, in particular okay. in, in countries where the dynamic needs to change, yeah. absolutely yeah. needs to change. So Amaya, you have already introduced what will be my last question by now because we have a lot of questions from the public but I would like to pose it also to the other two speakers that is so what could be done what could be done both at the European level but also at the national level and by scientists themselves uh, um, maybe Catherine mm, this is just biting off one particular chunk of that question and a little bit in follow-up what's been said before. Um, I, I think uh, a lot can be done in terms of making sure that we have um, better m mobility uh, and, and uh, within, within Europe. I mean real 
mobility, uh, with open systems. And um, so within the Commission, they are talking about this. I was in a working group where they were discussing so-called uh, open, merit-based, transparent uh, recruitment. You know, the, the thing is that you <laughs> don't want it to be a closed shop. You know, you want people to be able to access uh, the possibilities for getting jobs wherever they are in Europe. Now, the Commission has to be careful where they're treading on national competencies. Some of this is a national competence, and they cannot change this, and they cannot influence this. But they can give, again, um, the sort of the, the good example in their policies and in their funding program in Horizon 2020. I know they're thinking about, for instance, ways of, let's say, uh, when you apply for Horizon 2020 funding, in the rules of participation, it says a lot of things of what you can or should and must do. Um, and right now it also says that you should follow the charter and code for researchers. They could get more specific also. It also already says things about doing good things in terms of research careers. They, they could get a little bit more um, um, pushy, uh, a little little bit more pushing pushing institutions, pushing uh, to say, well, if you're going to hire people in the context of this process, make sure that it's done on a transparent and an open and a merit-based uh, way. Okay. The problem there is the accountability, right? Your thoughts. What's the problem? The accountability. Yeah. How do you make sure that that happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, I see. What do you think, Yaron? Well, I'd in agree terms of with solutions, that. actions. That yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that point completely about um, uh, recruitment um, and, and career structures in general. It's the number one issue for, for, for European science, I think. Uh, and it is hard to see how how the Commission fits into that, or how the European Union fits into that. How, how does the Council of Ministers, you know, um, work with member states to to promote those models? And maybe some of the things that Amaya said, like eligibility for European funds being contingent on certain. I, I think you know, you know, I can't see that being agreed in the Council of Ministers. But at the same time, I can see that that might be the way that the, the way to, to 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 do these things. In terms of the things, other things I'd like to see apart from that, I think um, I'd uh, um, I, and you do you have seen this in some some European countries um, a move away from. Uh, kind of guaranteed core funding to, to big institutions to um, to more competitively won funding. I think getting that balance right is difficult. In the UK, the balance is about 20 or 30 percent core funding to universities for research that they can then spend how they like, and the remainder is competitively won. Um, but even that 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 core block funding for research, uh, it's it's dependent on. Um, Competition in the sense that the universities have to go through a research assessment uh, process, and and it's based on um, supposedly on, on on peer review of um, uh, of published outputs. Um, so I, I'd say looking at those balance between kind of block funding and competitively won funding, because uh, I think um, having a high level of competitively won funding, as you see in, in countries like the, the the UK and the US, is one of the um, um, Drivers of dynamism. It creates job opportunities for scientists, which attract them in. Um, it, 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 it creates pressures. It has, it has downsides as well. So you need to get the balance right, um, and that needs to that needs to, to go alongside having the right kind of employment conditions, the right kind of contracts, the right kind of independence or autonomy for research performing organisations like universities, um, so that mm -hmm. you know, so that the the, 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 the their ability to, to take advantage of that kind of funding mechanism isn't Constrained by contracts and um, uh, 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 you know the kind of some bureaucratic conditions that go with um, you know public servant status that kind of thing. Okay, so we have. Um, I mean, I would have a lot of a lot of more questions, uh, but uh, we have already five from the public, and the number of participants has increased in the meantime. So I will try to read you some of the questions. So um, one of them is by Lydia, and she says, um, I think she's from Bulgaria, I understand from her question. So she says, over the years, the European Union has implemented a number of initiatives to encourage mobility among, research among researchers. 
well, among states, I think. However, some areas of the European Union are less appealing to scientists, and we witness just a one direction flow of scientists leading to brain drain. For example, it is very rare for a researcher to come to Bulgaria to do research or work on some exchange project. Do you have any suggestions on how this tendency can be changed? Is it just a matter of funding or some other factors such as stereotypes, perception, jurisdiction? I would say maybe Kieron is the more entitled because he has done academic research on this, if you, are, if you all agree. I can go first and then I'm sure others will have something to say. I think it goes yeah. back to the point that we've just been dis discussing. I think um, it's not Bulgaria as a country that's not attractive to people. You know, maybe there are some prejudices and things like that. It's, it's Bulgaria as a science system, as a research system that, that is not attractive to people. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So maybe there are some issues around promotion and, and all of that, but, but you know, uh, it's fundamentally about what does that system have to, have to offer. Uh, people um, to attract attract them to go there. Yeah, and in the first place, do you agree that there is this uh, strongly unbalanced mobility? Because I understand it's not so easy to measure, right? Uh, it's, it's the problem with measuring mobility is there's no, you know, life goes on, <laughs> so you you yeah. have to you have to stop measuring at a particular point, but you don't know that all the people don't then go back immediately after you stop measuring. So um, yeah. there's no way you can say. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, for sure um, that there's a certain proportion of people that don't return. You can only say there's a certain proportion of people that don't return within a particular time period, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And in principle, mobility is a good thing. Of course, the, the, the European Union promotes mobility for, for kind of cultural and political reasons as much as for scientific ones, although, you know, uh, mobility is often associated with excellence. Um, yeah. Mobility is also forced on people by limited opportunities in their home countries, um, uh, uh, perhaps problems with um, uh, their, their, their you know, career in, the, in those countries, and the attraction of, of greater opportunities in other places. It's natural, scientists will always move to, to collaborate with um, collaborators they want to work with, to work in, with facilities they want to work with, and those will always be distributed all over the place. There will always be a high level of, of, of mobility. Uh, what we should be worried about is the in, enforced mobility of people leaving a place because there are no opportunities or, or, or the opportunities involve, um, you know, um, kind of making, uh, you know, kind of fitting in with a, an unmeritocratic system that, that they don't feel comfortable with fitting in. To. Those yeah. are the kinds of things that and, that and not only live about. in a particular place, but also live in uh, research altogether. In Spain, yeah. according to the Spanish National Institute of Statistics, we've lost 11,000 researchers mm -hmm. in three years, from 2010 to 2013. Mm -hmm. So you know, I call that mobility, but not the good mobility yeah. that we want mm -hmm. to, to see. So yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so, more questions, uh, Maria uh, from Romania, she says, in some countries there are funds to rights research proposals, for example in Ireland, or short-term employment for this, like in Germany. So, how can a proposal from Romania for Horizon 2020 compete with such if the proposal is written besides of the daily job? I think she means that in some countries there is, there is no administrative support for for a, for a writing proposal, what are you, what are your thoughts about it? I mean, is there is the field not level even at this uh, stage? Let's say, for example, Katrin, would you would you think that uh, between the twenty one universities there is massive differences in how the administrative aspect of proposals is handled? Or is there a common standard? Uh, there are differences, but by and large, I mean, the differences between um, Liri types of universities, not just the 21, but Liri types universities. And, you know, there are a couple of thousand of universities uh, in, in Europe. Um, if I look at the other side of the continuum, 
it's it's it th that's where the really big difference is and that's why I said before I think it's helpful that the Commission makes available uh, money uh, for expertise like national contact points to to uh, of of, of mm. in countries where they have well developed systems to help in countries where the systems are not so well developed to get that expertise to help apply for for funds and so on and um, I think um, we I mean. Of, I, I, I regularly get people asking me from, from my university, we want to put in a proposal uh, for Horizon 2020 call, um, we want to involve a central or eastern or whatever uh, um, a, a partner, uh, but we don't know how to find them, where are they, do you have any suggestions for who we could contact? So perhaps there's okay. a role there in making some things more transparent, making things um, visible, um, yeah. sort of yeah. matchmaking. Um, there's a, a lot of these matchmaking um, events that go on in Brussels, looking for partners uh, to, to mm. participate. Horizon 2020 calls. Um, perhaps okay. there could be actions there to make sure that um, less that less performing systems can participate actually in this and 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 get the 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 the, the networks and the, um, get tied into a bigger circle where they can where they can um, forge those networks and forge ties to 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 to, to okay. put them together. Yeah, I I will add that it's not only um, difficulties at the at the stage of applying for the for for the grants for the European grants. There are also significantly significant difficulties at the time of using the money when you won, win the grants. In Spain, for example, there yeah. has been cases where the system is so stiff that it's, it takes a long time to use the money, and the time is ticking, and the money goes away, and it's so difficult to hire people uh, just to to have all the documentation gone through the hiring process that you lose a year of a three-year contract. So, um, so it's a waste of European resources. So, you know, it's it's not only an applying, but it's also you know you need systems that are flexible enough to make the most of the money that uh, you know it's won in such tough competitions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You go back to another mm. point, also, making hard choices. I mean, mm, um, it's not as if things have always gone on a bed of roses in UK, Germany, France, the big research players either. And they've made painful uh, decisions as well to invest in science. And uh, again, going back to making choices and being smart, some of the countries, also not you know, the riches of countries, have said, um, look, for instance, if um, all these ERC applicants that don't get funded, uh, but you know, we know that they're really good. So we're going to find a pot of money to fund them, and they've already gone through a very strong selection process for the ERC. But not everybody can be funded there. But we'll accept them as um, you know, uh, as 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 good because they've gone through an European-wide peer review process. So we're going to find some money and invest in those people. You know, and if you're smart mm -hmm. about it, you could try and attract those people also to another country. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, there is uh, another question by uh, Lydia, Lis uh, uh, sorry, Licha, um, and she that touches on what Amaya was uh, was uh, mentioning. So she said she starts saying it's very bad. <laughs> it's the first thing she says. So she she says in the south national funding is reducing and no continuity can be given to the European Union funding. My personal example is that having obtained a ERC grant, the national funding does not step in, and the group, along with all the know-how, dies off. Consequently, people have to be laid off. So I think this is a really, really relevant and remarkable problem because, you know, it's kind of starting from an ERC grant mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, that it expected to be like a starting point of a brilliant career and then it, it stops. What do you it think? Goes, yeah, it goes back to what Kiron was saying about having this initiative being a drop in the desert, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a long, it's, it does what is happening in some cases. It's it's it's, it's, yeah. it's such a huge waste of taxpayers' money that for that to happen, it, and it's a terrible personal shame for the people 
the people in, 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 involved. In, in a sense, it comes back to what is the purpose of, of European funding. I think the, the, the European programs originated mm -hmm. out of a, a, um, you know, uh, the, the framework programs were originally very technologically oriented. They were they, they originated out of a need, a perceived need to, to to boost European competitiveness, to support European industry really, and, and technological innovation in industry. And universities and research came into that in order to support that. Uh, but increasingly, the, the European programs are used as a kind of compensation for for problems in in the member states. But they can't possibly provide continuity of funding. They can't possibly provide stable environment for that. That can only come from the the member states. Um, uh, in, in a way, in some countries, perhaps they've been content to allow the European Union programs to to support their scientists, you know, uh, you know, to keep some level of activity going. But um, it, everybody loses because it's not in anybody's interests for for for, for science to to, to 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 work in kind of fits and starts like that. For for an investment to be made, a group to be built up, and then that have to be broken up. And, and, and science doesn't work very well when, when money goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. It, it's better for it to okay. be to be a lower level but consistent. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, there is one more question. In fact, two more questions, I think, and then I think we we are almost done. Uh, this is from Thomas, uh, who belongs to the European University Association. And he says, we are talking a lot about uh, systems. I think he refers to national systems. But what can the governance of individual research institutions do to, in terms of increased divergence or, uh, or increased convergence, sorry, or divergence in terms of efficiency? What can be done individually at the level of the individual institution from, one, from your point of view? Or, or are individual institution doomed to share the destiny of the country where they are. It varies, doesn't it? Some countries, um, the, the, the freedom of universities is very tightly prescribed um, uh, by law. Um, they're, 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 they're regulated in, 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 a, in a very tight way. In other countries, uh, they're highly autonomous uh, in, or, or even independent. Um, the, they may be have a, a protected position uh, in in law, but, but 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 that doesn't limit or prescribe what they can and can't do or how they can and can't work, uh, except perhaps in some very basic mm -hmm. ways like they shouldn't be making profits, that kind of thing. So it, it, it depends how much level. They, in many countries, our our research performing institutions don't have a high degree of freedom. They're either part of big national networks like uh, the, the Spanish um, Research Council institutes are part of big net networks where a lot of governance and financial Management happens at the at the high level. Yeah, but they don't they don't have any uh, they they don't have much leverage either. So their hands are very tight as well. Mm -hmm. So so it, it depends on the legal models, I think, and that's the in the end it comes comes back to, to what we've been saying all the way through this debate. You know, there are some models that we have in Europe that are that are either you know 19th century models. Or medieval models that are not necessarily appropriate for 21st century science, and um, you know those countries perhaps that, that, that have those models. And of course, there's always there are always interests. Uh, um, there are always people whose interest it is to maintain that model. There are there are always some people who do very well in these systems. So um, and they're in a, in 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 a, in a position where they may be able to defend that. But uh, you know mm -hmm. to look at look at those other parts of Europe where uh, institutions with a long history, like if you look at the, the membership yeah. of, of, of Katrin's organization, there's some very um, historic universities there, but that are hmm. that are able to be innovative and, and flexible and, and to, to act, um, um, you know, in a way that 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 that, uh, that is is relevant to the needs of today, not to, to to patterns from a very long time ago. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, our, please, please, yes. I just make the point that we were making uh, earlier, actually, in, in the pre-webinar uh, conversation we were having about being activist. Um, I think this uh, counts. This is uh, valid for individual researchers and for universities as well. Uh, my point with individual researchers was 
when we see when when farmers have a problem, they go to Brussels and they uh, spray the streets with uh, milk and they stop traffic with their tractors. Researchers really don't speak up in Brussels enough. They are not heard in a way that uh, others are heard. And I think universities have a responsibility to do this as well, both at the national level and at the EU level, uh, to, to, to really say how, how important this is and how they are committed to this agenda, uh, either at the national level or at the EU level. So to be a bit more, to be, to be outspoken, um, not to be afraid of being uh, uh, um, uh, a lobbyist, you know, for the long time. For a long time, I think universities would have said, "Oh no, 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 you know, oh lobbying, that's not for us. That's something that industry does. You know, we are public yeah. institutions and so on." Yeah. Uh, but there, I think there are issues at stake here that universities can speak to and that they should speak to because of the role and the position uh, that they have uh, in in society, not just in research. Mm -hmm in education and, and, and the larger mission in terms of, you know, being an, a, a part and parcel of the society. Mm -hmm. I would agree yeah. with that completely. I would, I would reinforce that. I, one thing I would say is um, I agree completely that, that, that scientists should, should perhaps be more um, engaged in, in these debates. Uh, I think the level of engagement needs to get a little bit more sophisticated. Sometimes it can just amount to spend more money, spend more money, spend mm -hmm. more money. Um, mm -hmm. And money isn't always the answer. A lot of the things we've talked about today have not really been about levels of funding. They've been about the way money is spent and the structures and the um, uh, kind of cultures yeah. uh, of, 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 of research systems. Uh, one thing I would say is it's easy for us to think that this is the natural way of doing science, that, that taxpayer money funding fundamental research is the natural way, but it's only a thing, it's only a few decades old in most European countries. It's, it's, it's a post-Second World War phenomenon, really, um, large-scale taxpayer support for science. Most science, most technology dates back to period before that was the case. So it's a kind of precious thing that we have. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a precious thing. It's not the natural way. It does need defending, but it needs to be defended in a kind of, in quite a sophisticated way. Just talking about money, maybe, maybe just promising economic benefits um, is perhaps not the sophisticated way to go. I think what Katrin said is right. Science is embedded in our, our culture. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a, a hugely important part of European culture. It's one of our, the great contributions that Europe has made to, to, to global culture. And we should be unapologetic about that. It's not just a narrow thing of R&D and GDP and all of that. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a vital part of who we are as Europeans. And, and, and we should um, not be afraid to, to, to make that case as well. I think, Amaya, you may have something to say because you have been and you are still an activist scientist somehow. I mean, well, yes. You, you didn't pour milk on the street, but something similar. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I guess we try to take a more um, direct approach of actually proposing things to Congress and proposing things uh, to, you know, fight against budget cuts. So it was kind of, you know, pouring milk in Congress <laughs> in a way. So um, mm -hmm. I think um, in Spain what I have learned is that it's very difficult to mobilize the establishment the scientific and, uh, and, and higher education establishment. Um, in these mobilizations, we've been trying to engage always the confederations of uh, university chancellors. It's very 